Amen. Take your Bibles, turn over, please, to the book of Genesis. Thank you so much for that beautiful song. Good question. Is anything too hard for God? The answer is no, there's not. Amen. Genesis chapter 39, when you find your place, stand with me, please. Or just go ahead and stand and look for it. We're, we're, we're down to the preaching. By now you should have gotten some water and used the bathroom. I, I may need to preach a message sometime on how to, how to behave in church. This is not the ball game. Okay, I don't preach that long. Uh, Wednesday night was a nightmare for me. It, it, the, the getting up and going out and the distractions, it was, it was a tool of Satan. Fortunately, it didn't ruin the service, but it did for me. It took me about two days to get over it. Uh, when you come to church, you come to get in, not get out, okay? Um, so if you would do me a favor, if you would just bear with me and just stay in your seat till this is over with, I appreciate it. I won't keep you too long. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to keep a train of thought when you've just got people constantly coming in and out. And ushers, if you would, if somebody comes in after the, at this point, put them in the balcony, okay? Let's, let's keep the moving around to a minimum. I would appreciate it so very much, okay? Uh, the, the, devil, the devil attacks the mind of God's man when he's trying to preach. And you don't want to be a distraction to the preacher or to those sitting around you. Make sure your phones are off. Hey Amen. No, no, no check in the ball game. I don't think any ball games are on right now. There may be a ball game on before I get done, though. Who knows? That might be one start. Uh, I heard about the guy that got up in the middle of the service and walked out. And after the service, the preacher went to him and said, why would you get up in the middle of my message and go out? He said, I went, I went to get a haircut. He said, why didn't you get a haircut before church? He said, I didn't need one. <laughs> I don't preach that long, all right. But if you could bear with me, let's keep the getting up and going out to a minimum. I would appreciate it so very much. Genesis 39. Let's look at verse number one. Joseph was brought down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord had made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him. And he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had put into his hand. And all that he had, he put into his hand. Verse 5, and it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. And he knew not all he had save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person. And well favored, and it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither kept he back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass... As she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her, but lie by, to lie by her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time, verse 11, that Joseph went into the house to do his business. And there was none of the men of the house there within. And she called him by his garment, saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. I want to preach this morning. We're going to pick back up with the series on the coats of Joseph. And uh, we're going to just pray and we're going to jump right into the message. All right, so pray with me. Father, we come to you this evening, this morning rather, we ask you if you would to help us now. The singing's been tremendous. Our hearts have been stirred and challenged, but now we're getting down to the preaching of the word of God. And Father, I pray a hedge up around this place. I pray, Lord, that you would bind the devils and demons of hell. And I pray that you would allow God's people to worship you this morning in spirit 
and in truth. Allow me to be able to rightly divide and to preach and expound the scriptures. May God's children be fed and blessed and encouraged and challenged. And if there's anybody here today that's not saved, I pray today they would get saved. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Thank you so much for standing. You can be seated. I will not take the time to repeat or recap last week's message. If you missed message one in this four-part series, you're going to have to go back and listen to it. A lot of people think about the coat of Joseph. They think about that coat, that, that, that uh, coat of many colors. That's the first thing everybody thinks about. But there were actually, in the story in the life of Joseph, there were four very distinct and different coats. And we're going to look at them over the course of this series. But in chapter 37... Verse number three, there was a son, he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. And we looked last week at the first coat. This is the coat of the sun. Each one of these four coats in the life of Joseph are an amazing typology of the portrayal of the Lord Jesus Christ in each of the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Last week we looked at the coat of the sun and I don't have time to recap all that, but that was a picture of Christ the Son, uh, the, the coat of the Son as described in the Gospel of John. John describes Jesus as the Son of God. Then in our text this morning, chapter 39, and in verse number 12 and 13, we find another coat. This is the coat of the servant. This is the coat of the servant. We're going to look at that this morning. And this is the Lord Jesus Christ as described in the Gospel of Mark. The other two coats that we'll get to eventually in the next couple of weeks, Lord willing, is found in chapter 41. And in verse number 14, the Bible says that Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon and he shaved himself and changed his raiment. There's the third coat that we find. This is the coat of the sinner. And this is the picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospel of Luke. He's described as the Son of Man. Now we know Jesus was not a sinner, but he took the place of us as sinners. And of course, Joseph was in prison for a sin he did not commit. A beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospel of Luke. And then in chapter 41, verse number 42, Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck, made him ruler over all the land of Egypt, verse 43. This is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel of Matthew, the coat of the sovereign. So with the Lord's help this morning, we're going to look at this second, this second coat that we find is the coat of the servant in Genesis chapter number 39. If you'll remember in chapter 37, his brethren, they sold him to a band of Ishmaelites. And the Bible says in verse number one of chapter 39, he was brought down to Egypt. And I just want to take a minute before I get into my outline and just look at this typology. The type of the Lord Jesus Christ as a servant in this story right here, it's described in the gospel of Mark. The gospel of Mark actually leaves off the lineage and the ancestry and the birth of Christ and jumps right into the ministry of Jesus Christ in Mark chapter number one. In fact, if you read Mark chapter number one, you don't read very far, but what he's already performing miracles, casting out devils, he's meeting the needs of the people, he's busy serving the Lord in Mark chapter number one. The portrait of Christ as a servant that we see in the gospel of Mark was written by a servant. John Mark. In fact, Acts chapter number 12, verse number 25 tells us that John Mark, the one that wrote the gospel of Mark, Paul and Barnabas uh, returned from Jerusalem, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. And in Acts chapter 13, verse number five says they had John with them to minister. So the book of Mark was written about the servant, the Lord Jesus Christ, by a servant named John Mark. And the word minister in Acts chapter number 13, verse 5, that describes John Mark, the author of the gospel of Mark, the word minister is very interesting. And the word minister is used, uh, it translated five different Greek words depending on how it's used in the New Testament. But in Acts chapter 13, verse number 5, the word minister that is used to describe John Mark is the lowest minister, the lowest 
usage of the word. It's the lowest of all the ranks. It literally in the Greek means an under rower or a subordinate rower. We know the Greeks didn't have steamships and the capabilities that we have today. And those ships were propelled, propelled by men down in the bottom of those ships that were the oarsmen, the rowers. And the slaves, many times galley slaves, were put in the bottom of those ships. If you remember the old Charlton Heston movie, Ben-Hur, and you get the idea of those old slaves down in the bottom of those ships, rowing those ships. That is literally the Greek word used to describe John Mark as an under rower, the lowest rank of slave position in the most difficult spot on the boat that had to do the rowing with a short, a little unwieldy uh, oar. And so this is the social rank that is ascribed to John Mark, the author of the gospel of Mark. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying all this for a reason because uh, at one part, at one point in Mark's life, he was actually considered an unfaithful servant, an unreliable, untrustworthy assistant in the ministry. And in Acts chapter number 13, verse number 13, John Mark started out with Paul and Barnabas on this first journey and not too far into it, he bailed. And he went back home and he abandoned them. Later on, when Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with him again, Paul said, I don't want him to go. And there was such a strife and a contention between Barnabas and Paul over this. They end up splitting up and, and, and Barnabas took John Mark and they went on a missionary journey. Paul took Silas and he went, they went their separate ways. But the point I want to make was this, though Mark was an unfaithful servant at the beginning, God in his providence allowed Mark to write a gospel depicting the Lord Jesus Christ as none other than a faithful servant. Later on, John became a faithful servant. In fact, the apostle Paul has said he's profitable, profitable. Bring Mark with you next time you come see me because he's profitable, amen. But I begin to notice some very interesting correlations just in John Mark and Joseph in this story right here. It has nothing to do with the message, but it fascinated me because in our text in Genesis 39, Joseph left his coat as he fled in verse number 12. You get to Mark chapter 14, verse 50 down through verse number 52, Mark also fled and left his coat. The Bible says in Mark chapter 14, verse 50, they all forsook him and fled and there followed him a certain young man having a linen coat cast about his naked body and the young men laid hold on him and he left the linen coat and fled from them naked. Similarities in Joseph and Mark in our story, both of them were alone and vulnerable. Both of them bore shame for doing what was right and following the Lord. Both of them refused to be associated with the wrong crowd. Both of them had their coats removed from them by others with bad intentions. Both of them were left vulnerable and unprotected with a stigma of shame attached to it. One was a type of Christ the servant and one wrote about Christ the servant. That kind of stuff fascinates me. But I want to, if we can this morning, look in our text in chapter 39, just in this little story that we read about Joseph and see if we can see some typologies that are absolutely amazing to me. Typologies of the Lord Jesus Christ found in the life of Joseph here in chapter 39 as a servant. The first thing I want to notice, if you're taking notes, I want you to notice his place as a servant. Joseph's place as a servant. Now, verse number one says that, Joseph was brought down to Egypt. Is that what your Bible says? Now, geographically, Egypt is south of where Jacob and his family lived in chapter 37, verse 1. The Bible says that they dwelt in the land of Canaan. Uh, and so, obviously, Egypt is down on the southern end, the north side of Africa. But I want to notice that there's two interesting correlations in Genesis 39 and verse number one and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at these. First of all, there's the, there is the physical typology. Watch this. When the wise men did not return to tell Herod where Jesus was, if you'll remember, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and told him to arise and go to Egypt. So it's fascinating to me that in Genesis chapter 39, Joseph ended up in Egypt because of his dreams. In Matthew 2.13, Jesus ended up 
in Egypt because of the dreams of a man named Joseph. So there's the physical typology where Jesus literally as a baby went down, was carried down to Egypt. But then you got the spiritual typology because Genesis 39.1 says Joseph was brought down to Egypt. Now Egypt is a type and a picture of the world, more specifically the unsaved lost world that you and I were in before we got saved. That's what Egypt is a type and a picture of. So we see here that Joseph was brought down to Egypt. He was subject to the will of another. Just as Joseph was brought down to Egypt, Jesus was brought down to spiritual Egypt. Amen. Jesus said in John 6, 38, for I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Do you see the connection there? As Joseph was brought down to Egypt by the will of others to serve others, that is exactly what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus often referred to how out of place he was in this world. He repeatedly mentioned being sent. John chapter nine, verse four and five. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus was brought down to Egypt, the world to serve, just like Joseph was brought down to Egypt to serve. Jesus said in John chapter five, verse number 36, I have greater witness uh, than that of John for the works which the father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do. Bear witness of me that the father hath sent me. So Jesus lived on this earth having been sent by the father down to spiritual Egypt to do the works Amen. We see the place as a servant. But then secondly, we see his position as a servant. The Bible tells us that after he was sold, he was taken to Egypt in verse number one. After he was bought of Pharaoh, he was bought of, 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 the, of Potiphar, uh, the guard, an Egyptian, he bought him out of the hands of the Ishmaelites. Now, we, we have to assume, we don't have to assume, we, we know his coat of many colors had been stripped of him and dipped in blood and sent back to his father as a testimony and a witness that he had died. Remember that? That was last week's message. So we know that when he got to Egypt in the house of Potiphar, either provided by the Ishmaelites or by Potiphar, he was given another coat. This was the coat that we find in verse number 12 and 13. Well, can we agree that his role as the favored son of his father was obscured by these new garments? This, he no longer wore the coat of many colors, this, this, this glory of the father that was bestowed upon him. The, he's now wearing the garments of a common slave. This garment that we find in our text in verse number 12 and 13 was the cheapest, no doubt the most common, most ordinary of garments. I think that's what Paul was talking about in Philippians 2, 7. We're talking about Lord Jesus Christ. He made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. It was made in the likeness of men. That word form in the Greek in Philippians 2, 7 literally is the word morphe, which means the form by which a person or a thing strikes a vision. It goes on to mean an external appearance. So not only was he a servant, but he put on the form of a servant. It was obvious to everybody around him that he was a servant. In fact, his servanthood, his servant garments obscured his deity in many places. Amen. Everybody that knew him saw him ministering and serving and healing and doing the work of the Father. What they didn't see was that he, the word had been made flesh and that he was literally God in the flesh. His robes of deity were obscured by the robes of the servant. God in the flesh took upon him the form of a servant. What a picture. The Bible's clear what was expected of Joseph. The Bible tells us that Joseph, when he was brought down to Egypt, verse number one, Potiphar bought him, and in verse number two, became his master. The Bible says that he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. 
I see the typology here of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking about the position that Joseph had as a servant in Genesis 39 and how it matches up with the Lord Jesus Christ and his position as a servant. In Mark chapter 10 and verse number 45, the Bible says, for even the son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Somebody's phone is on. We see a couple of things about this servant that I want you to notice, the position of the servant. First of all, it was a position of great fruitfulness. The Bible tells us about Joseph in verse number two that he, the Lord was with Joseph and he was a prosperous man. You see that? The Bible says in verse number three that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. In fact, he was so fruitful and so prosperous that it spilled over to the household of the Egyptian. In verse number five, the Bible says the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. Are y'all getting this? So he was in a position of great fruitfulness. Well, you get to Mark chapter number seven, verse number 37 talks about the Lord Jesus. The Bible says, and they were beyond measure astonished, saying, he hath done all things well. He maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. He wasn't just a servant, but he was a fruitful servant. Everything he did prospered. Everything he did was absolutely perfect. You could not improve on anything that the Lord Jesus Christ put his hand to. I mean, there was not a single problem that came to him that he couldn't fix. There wasn't a single person that came to him that he could not help and minister to. God touched and blessed the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was prosperous. It was a position of great fruitfulness. Secondly, it was a position of great fervency. Joseph was diligent. Joseph was busy about his father's business, master's business rather. In Genesis 39, 11, the Bible says it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business. It's the first time you find the word business used in the Bible. And it is Joseph serving his master. Well, you get to Luke chapter number two, the type of the Lord Jesus Christ, when his parents left him for three days and they finally found him in the temple, he said, wish ye not that I must be about my father's business? That's the first time you find the word business used in the New Testament and it is Jesus doing the business of the father. The first time you find business in the Old Testament is Joseph doing the business of his master. And when you find Jesus doing the business, you know what else, Joseph, the Bible says that Joseph went into the house, here's what it says, I love this, in verse number 11. The Bible says Joseph went into the house to do his business. You see that? Did anybody catch that? Actually, it was Potiphar's business. But Joseph, come on y'all, Joseph made the master's business his business. Whoa, you know what Jesus did? Jesus made the father's business his business. And at the age of 12, he looked at Mary and Joseph and said, I cannot believe, I'm paraphrasing, I cannot believe you looked all over town for me. You should have started here because you ought to know that I'm gonna be busy doing the father's business because I've made the father's business my business. A position of great fervency. Thirdly, it was a position of great favor. The Bible tells us in Genesis 39, verse number six, that Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. What a type of Christ. Luke chapter two, verse 40. The child grew, waxed strong in the Lord, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Verse 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. It was a position of great favor. Boy, as I began to research this and study this, I, I sat at the table yesterday morning, I told my wife, I said, every time I look at these verses, I said, I love my Bible even more. You will never convince me man wrote this Bible. When you've got two books, Moses wrote Exodus, and then you've got John Mark over here and the others writing the Gospels and how perfectly they match up, the typologies match up, 
You couldn't come up with this on your own if you tried. Thousands of years apart. I looked up the phrase, God was with him. You ready for this? You'll find both phrases in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter seven, verse number nine, it says, and the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. And then down in Acts chapter 10 and verse number 38, it said how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. Both phrases, one talks about Joseph, the other one talks about the Lord Jesus Christ and the one that talks about the Lord Jesus Christ specifically talks about his service and his ministry. God was with him. Position of great favor. Do you realize how many people that, that Potiphar had to have had working for him? You have to imagine he had, he, I don't know what kind of work he was in, the Bible don't tell us, it some kind of farming or ranching or some enterprise that required slaves and servants, required a steward, an overseer. And here Joseph comes in, he's a foreigner, he's an outsider. Comes into Egypt, has to learn a new language, has to learn a new culture, has to learn a whole new trade and vocation. I mean, they were shepherds. And he comes in and he surpasses all of his colleagues and associates and he rises to the top. It was a position of great favor. But then fourthly, it was a position of great faithfulness. Joseph was faithful. In our text this morning in chapter 39 of Genesis, he was faithful to his position he was faithful to his master and he was faithful to his God. You find that in verse, number th in verse number nine. He said to Potiphar's wife, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Picture of faithfulness. What a type of Christ we find here. Jesus took his role as a servant very seriously, and he was faithful. In fact, Revelation 19, 11, Bible says, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and him that sat upon him was called, faithful with a capital F, faithful and true, capital T. He was called faithful and true in the book of Revelation because he was not a slacker. Jesus, once he began his earthly ministry, was diligent to serve and to work and to labor and his days were filled with preaching and teaching and healing and touching lives and performing miracles and his nights were filled with praying and looking out for his disciples. His prayer in John 17 was evident of his diligence and his awareness of his work. In John 17, 4, he says, I've glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. On the cross, Jesus, with all that was going on, all the suffering and the pain and the agony that he was in, the shame, the embarrassment, and the whole circumstance in which he found himself in that passage of scripture, his mind was on the completion of his work as a servant. He uttered seven sayings while he was on the cross and one of them was in reference to his work in John 19, 30 when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar. He said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. That phrase, it is finished, was a statement that signified that the order of his master had been followed and had been completed. His work, his ministry, his labor had been fulfilled. We see his position as a servant. But then thirdly, we see his power as a servant. Though Joseph was a servant, he was in a position of tremendous authority. He came in at ground level, as we just mentioned in verse number one. And the Bible says that he rose to the top in this story came in at ground level, but rose to a position of complete control and leadership. Are y'all still with me? He went from slave to steward. He went from a foreign servant to the overseer of the house and the business and the affairs of Potiphar. His authority was complete and his master placed him over everything that he had. Stay with me now. The Bible's very clear in our text. Look at verse number four. Joseph found grace in his sight and he served him and he made him overseer over his house and all that he had put into his hand. Verse five, came to pass from the time that he made him overseer 
of his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the Lord, the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, verse number six. And he knew not all he had save the bread which he did eat. Look at what Joseph said at the end of verse number eight. The Bible says, what my master wanteth not what's with me in the house. And he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There's none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me. Over and over and over again in, this, in these few verses, we are, we are given the, the clear picture that Potiphar completely entrusted everything he had into the hand of Joseph. Are y'all still with me? <laughs> what a type of Christ this was. Because you get over to the gospels and though Jesus was a servant, he had been given Everything. Bible says in John, uh, in John chapter uh, thirteen, verse number three, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into His hands, and that He was come from God, and went to God, God entrusted literally all things into the hand of Jesus, according to John seventeen, verse number seven. Jesus said, "Now they had known that all things whatsoever Thou hast given me are of Thee." In John seventeen eight. He said, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. So God entrusted all things to Jesus in John 17, 7. And in verse number eight, he entrusted unto him the word of God. The words which thou gavest me, and they have received them. And have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Then you get to verse number nine, and we find that Jesus Christ was entrusted with the children of God. I pray for them, verse nine. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Verse 11 of John 17. And now I'm no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. In John chapter five, verse number 22, he said, for the father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the son. So God gave him all judgment. Matthew 28, verse number 18, God gave him all power. Jesus came and spake, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Are y'all getting this this morning? Joseph, the Bible tells us over and over and over, was given everything into his hand entrusted into his hand by his master and Jesus, a type, a beautiful picture there that Joseph portrays. God gave everything into the hands of Jesus and trusted him with all of it. We see his power. Fourthly, we see his purity as a servant. His purity as a servant. When you read this story, where everything's going well, Get down to verse number six. Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. But then, verse number seven, it came to pass after these things. I, mo I'm, I mark this in my Bible. Temptation follows triumph. When everything's going great, be ready. Be ready. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and she said, lie with me. And the Bible goes on to tell us in verse number eight, but he refused and said unto his master's wife, behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house. And he hath committed all that he hath in my hand. He says in verse number nine, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Look at verse 10, it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day. Day by day, three things I notice about his purity as a servant. We see the temptation was vigorous, vigorous, day by day. Here's a young man, somewhere between 17 and 30. Here's a young man, away from family, away from home, away from anybody and everybody that knew him living in a heathen land surrounded by heathens. And Potiphar's wife is after him hard every day, day by day. Temptation was vigorous. 
The timing was vulnerable. The Bible says in verse 11, it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business and there was none of the men of the house there within. That's there for a reason. This was a time when Joseph was very vulnerable. Stay with me. He was vulnerable for two reasons. Number one, there was no third person there to prevent the temptation from even taking place. Listen to me very careful. I'm going to get distracted if I'm not careful. A lot of people would sin a lot less if they wouldn't put themselves in vulnerable positions. You keep, your, you keep yourself accountable. You watch out for these guys that go off all the time to places and nobody knows where they are. You're asking for it. Amen. Accountability. He was vulnerable because there was nobody there to keep the temptation from taking place in the first place. But then secondly, he was vulnerable because there was nobody there to see what really happened when it all came out. It was his word against hers. This is when the temptation took place, when he was vulnerable. We're going somewhere with this. We see the temptation was vigorous. The timing was vulnerable. But then thirdly, we see the tested was victorious. In spite of her advances, in spite of all that she did, he hearkened not, verse number 10, unto her to lie by her or to be with her. He didn't even want to be in the same room with her. All right. And we read from verse number 11 and 12 that he fled. She grabbed him by his garment. Lie with me, verse 12. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. We see that the, the, the man that was tested was victorious in this temptation and in this trial. What a beautiful type of picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. You get to Matthew chapter number four, Jesus faced an extreme temptation. The Bible says it like this in Hebrews that, he, that we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are. All right, so we see Jesus in Matthew four. He was in the, he's in the wilderness fasting and praying and the devil came to him. The Bible says the Holy Spirit of God led him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And guess what? Just like Joseph, the temptation was vigorous. The devil didn't just test, tempt him one time or test him one time. It was over and over and over. Three times in Matthew 4, the devil kept coming back, wouldn't take no for an answer. The temptation was vigorous. The timing was vulnerable. Jesus had never been more vulnerable, earthly, humanly speaking, than he is in Matthew 4. He had gone 40 days without eating. And yes, he had been praying. And yes, he had been fasting. But he was physically as weak and as vulnerable. And he was isolated. He was out in the wilderness. There was nobody else there but him and the devil and God. The temptation was vigorous. The timing was vulnerable. But praise the Lord, the tested was victory. Jesus stood on truth and Jesus stood on principle. And in Matthew 4, he kept coming back. He kept answering back. Uh, yea, yea, the word of God says, hath not God said, the scripture says, the word of God says this, God said this, the Lord said this. He kept coming back with scripture. Joseph's response was, he kept back, he hath not kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness? How can I sin against God? In other words, I serve Potiphar, Miss Potiphar. I serve Potiphar, not you. You know what Jesus said to Satan in Matthew 4, 11? In Matthew 14, then saith Jesus unto him, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt serve the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. What a beautiful type. Joseph is here of the tempter and the tested, the tested be, being victorious. I think it's interesting, Brother Leader, in Genesis 39, after he rejected the temptation, the Bible says Joseph left his garment in her hand and fled forth. In Matthew 4, 11, after Jesus rejected Satan, the Bible says, then the devil leaveth him. Amen. After the victory, put as much distance as you can between you and the temptation. Amen. 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 James said like this, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Is, that, is everybody getting all this? But number five, y'all got time for one more? We see his pattern as a servant. Now his first coat, the coat of the son, was stripped from him by his brethren. We saw that last week. His second coat, 
the coat of the servant was left laid up as an object lesson. Potiphar's wife referred to him in verse number 17 as the Hebrew servant. That's brought in verse 14. He brought in a Hebrew unto us. Verse number 17, the Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us. Joseph left his coat in the hands of Potiphar's wife. This coat was a symbol of his role as a servant. His coat was left as a reminder to her husband of his position as a servant. His coat was left as a reminder to other servants as the power of the servant. And his coat was left as a reminder to us of the purity of the servant. His coat that was left belonged to a servant that was in their world but was not of their world. Come on, y'all. He was in a position of great authority, but when it all came down, guess what he was? To the Egyptians, that Hebrew servant. A servant that was committed to being faithful and trustworthy in spite of the temptations, in spite of the trials. A servant that was given everything by his master to do what he was left here to do. Jesus was that kind of servant. And guess what? We're supposed to be that kind of servant. May we never forget the work the Lord Jesus did during his earthly ministry. He came at the request of his father, came down to Egypt to serve, to be a lowly servant. It was no longer about where he was from and who he was. It was all about doing the work that was put in front of him each and every day. When I look at the life of Joseph, I marvel. I've read this story so many times. I've preached on this story. I'm thinking to myself, if I'd have been him, I would have just run away. He could have figured out a way to sneak out of there. He could have crawled up under a wagon load of turnips and got out of there if he'd have wanted to. But you know what he did? He submitted to the work. Jesus submitted to the work. And guess what you and I, as servants of Almighty God, are supposed to do? Follow the example of Lord Jesus Christ. Quit looking for a way to get out of it. Do the work. Paul started every one of his epistles out. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Paul said, I will gladly spend and be spent for you. In one place, he said, you would plug my eye. You'd have plugged your eyes out and give it to me. You love me so much. But now, I'm your enemy because I tell you the truth. Paul was an off-scouring. I'm talking about the Apostle Paul. Follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder this morning, how are you matching up to the example that Jesus set as a servant? Stay with me. Listen to me. He left us here to do a job. You know what he said? Occupy. Occupy till I come. Look it up. It literally is steward. It's overseer. It is, we were given the same job that Joseph was given by Potiphar. To do the father's business. To do the work of God. I wonder this morning, I wonder if we understand the fact that we are in Egypt, but we are not of Egypt. Jesus prayed in John 17. He said, keep these disciples, keep these that thou hast given me. He said, they're in the world, but they're not of the world. Just cause we're neck deep in Egypt don't mean we gotta act like Egyptians. We can still live pure. We can still live clean. And he hath given us all power. Are you listening to me? All power, Jesus said, is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. Peter said he's given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. He gave us the scriptures that we may be truly furnished unto all good works. Ephesians chapter two says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We can sit here all morning and talk about Jesus and Joseph and the typologies, but at the end of the day, 
Where's the application? The application is that you and I are to be servants of the Most High God. You and I are to follow the examples of Joseph and Jesus Christ and serve our master with all of our heart and with faithfulness. I wonder this morning with heads bowed and eyes closed, there may be somebody here this morning, God's spoken to your heart, dealt with you during the message. You haven't been that faithful servant that God has called you to be. There may be someone here this morning, you've never been saved. You've never been born again. You cannot remember the time and place where you ever bowed your head, bowed your heart, and accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and received that free gift of salvation. I wonder if there'd be anybody in the service this morning while these are in the altar praying. There's plenty of room in the altar for more. The altars are full, but there's room for more. There may be somebody this morning say, Pastor Shiflin, I'm not sure if I died right now, I'd go to heaven. I'm not sure if I died right now that I'd go to heaven. And I want you to pray for me. Would you lift your hand? Would you raise your hand where I can see it? Preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure. I see that hand right there. God bless you. Anybody else? Preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure. Hold your hand where I can see it. We want to help you this morning. God wants to help you. God wants to do a work in your heart this morning. Would you let somebody help you?